There was no conspiracy involved in excluding women, even those who earned wages from government programs. Nor was there any conspiracy involved in assigning the best benefits to male workers. Rather, the distribution of jobs and wages and benefits were all governed by a shared commitment to family life and particularly to supporting what we've come to call male breadwinner families and the ideology of male breadwinning in which the 1930s was steeped. After all, the prevailing worldview, the gendered imagination, if you like, conceived men's and women's roles as partnerships in creating and maintaining the family it seemed no more than natural that unemployment insurance would help males to sustain households so that men who had lost their jobs could go back to them when the job market turned around. And it was more than appropriate that women be supported as mothers rather than as workers. Motherhood was, after all, women's most important job. Some of the best-known women leaders of the 1930s, and there were many during the New Deal years, shared the male breadwinner ideology. For example, Rose Schneiderman, a trade union leader since her young teenage years, who became a labor organizer and then president of first the New York and then the National Women's Trade Union League, willingly settled for special benefits for women. As a labor leader, Schneiderman and her friends Pauli Newman and Fania Cohn fought for education programs and leisure activities for female garment workers. Together, they worked on providing women with roses as well as bread. Schneiderman, who never married, befriended Eleanor Roosevelt in the 1920s and was appointed to the NIRA Code Planning Group for the Garment Industry in 1933. Though she never married and knew the importance of decent wages for independent women, she settled for wage differentials between men and women in garment jobs. Secretary of Labor Frances Perkins promoted the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 though it offered differential wages to men and women and excluded women from many of its regulations. This must have been a wrench for her. She had witnessed the famous 1911 Triangle Fire in which 146 workers, most of them women, died. She had been active in the National Consumers League and Labor Commissioner in New York State before she became Secretary of Labor in the federal government. On top of all this, she supported a sickly husband for years and raised a daughter. Yet she belonged to the network of social feminists who believed that women who could choose not to work for wages might give way to those who, when they needed to work, deserved protection. African-American leader Mary McLeod Bethune encouraged her middle-class peers to engage in racial uplift. Bethune started a school for girls that taught home care skills as well as more academic subjects. All of these women had something in common with the best-known woman leader of the 30s, Eleanor Roosevelt. Roosevelt, mother of five children, and wife of New York's governor and then president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was a longtime defender of working people and a member of the New York Women's Trade Union League. She believed, nevertheless, that a married woman might, in fact, be better off staying home with her children if she could afford to do so. We're going to learn more about Eleanor Roosevelt from Professor Blanche Cook, who is the author of a three-volume biography of Roosevelt.